Hi, my name is Deanna Strahlberg, and I'm with the Boreal Avian Modeling Project, or BAM. My colleague Peter Salamos and I will be talking to you about our work to develop new spatial abundance models that inform distribution, population, and trends for forest birds in Canada. I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm located in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, which is located on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional lands of First Nations and Métis people. Peter and I will talk to you today about a new set of models that builds on our previous work. Our models are always a work in progress, so we've set up a data portal on GitHub that should facilitate feedback and accommodate frequent updates. You'll hear more about the site from Peter later in the presentation. As we produce new versions, we will update the site accordingly. Older versions will be archived and metadata can be found on Zenodo at the link shown here. The Boreal Avian Modeling Project is focused on research, but one of the core goals is to inform population assessment. With our new models, we aim to develop an integrated approach that could be used to achieve a range of objectives at once. Specifically, our models are intended to result in population estimates, but also habitat-specific density estimates, as well as Canada-wide distribution maps that capture both broad-scale climate gradients as well as local habitat differences. And finally, the intention is to use our abundance models to improve regional trend estimates. Speaking of trends, everyone has probably heard about the paper in Science last year, led by Ken Rosenberg and other Partners in Flight members. There's nothing new about bird declines, but what was new about this paper was that the authors combined abundance and trend estimates to put a number on bird loss, which is all of a sudden very powerful. The paper estimated that 3 billion birds have been lost over the last 50 years, with the boreal region shown here in dark green, contributing about half a billion birds to the overall loss. So that's a really big responsibility. But we also have a lot more uncertainty in the north, as you can see by the error bars here. These error bars are focused on the trend, but we also have a lot of uncertainty about the underlying population numbers. The science paper used the best available population estimates from Partners in Flight, but for land birds, the numbers were based on BBS data, which are very sparse in the north due to the limited road network. At the same time, the vast boreal forest region is recognized as providing extremely important habitat for birds, with over 300 regularly breeding bird species, the large majority of which are migratory. So due to this lack of coordinated monitoring, data gaps are first on our list of data challenges. I've highlighted five central challenges here, which I will address one by one. This lack of coordinated monitoring is what prompted the creation of the Boreal Avian Modeling Project, or BAM, in 2004. The project was initiated to address the significant gaps in knowledge required to effectively manage and conserve boreal birds. The first step in this was to assemble a data set representing a compilation of point count survey data. The data set, which spans the boreal and hemiboreal regions of North America, or most of Canada, is a compilation of publicly available data, such as breeding bird atlases and BBS, as well as individual data sets that were generously contributed by numerous independent researchers and partners. By assembling enough individual point count data sets, shown in dark red on this map, we've been able to cover most of the environmental space in Canada south of the Arctic, where we've not collected survey data. This map shows percentiles of predicted survey effort based on over 100 environmental covariates and a single booster regression tree model that was based on a random sample of pixels drawn from this study area. So you can see that environmental conditions of northern regions are not very well sampled relative to southern Canada. But according to a different metric based on environmental similarity, there are just a few areas that really lie outside of the environmental space that we've sampled, which, are shown, which is shown in dark blue on this map. This environmental similarity surface, which emphasizes the magnitude of difference rather than sampling effort, shows us that the environmental conditions found in the far north and in west coast mountains are most different from what we have sampled in our data set. We're currently working on filling in these gaps in the west since the data do exist. Some of our earlier efforts took advantage of this environmental coverage to develop species distribution models based on climate and land cover using a method called Maxent. But these were habitat suitability models and did not incorporate abundance information. By modeling abundance, we can compare habitat value more accurately, but there are still many challenges involved. Because we're working with an ad hoc data set, our data are collected with a variety of different protocols under a range of conditions. And so this standardization problem is one that BAM has spent much of its early years working on. 
Most of this work was led by Peter Salamos, and there are now several papers you can refer to for more information about how we've standardized our data set. Although refinements are ongoing, the basic approach is summarized in a paper published in Methods in Ecology and Evolution in 2013. What we've done is to develop a method to convert count data from disparate sources into density using detectability-based correction factors. Our approach separates and models the two primary aspects of detectability. First is P of T, the probability of an individual bird singing within a given time interval. Obviously, the longer you count, the more birds you detect, and we used a removal model to estimate the singing rate parameter phi and the shape of this curve, curve shown here. The second, the second one is Q of R, the probability of detecting a singing bird within a given distance or radius. Of course, the farther away from the observer a bird is, the lower the probability that it will be heard and counted. We use distance sampling to estimate the shape of this curve based on the effective detection radius, or the, di the distance for which the probability of missing a species within that distance is equal to the probability of detecting a species that is outside the distance. For a given survey, the resulting values P and Q can then be combined with sampling area A to generate a correction factor that when multiplied by density yields the estimated count. Or in other words, the density can be estimated as a function of survey count n and these correction factors. The logarithm of the correction factors can be used as an offset in count regression models used to estimate density, as we have done. So with the standardization problem addressed, the next challenge we had to overcome was the fact that birds exhibit complex responses to environmental factors, especially over the large ranges occupied by most uh, northern forest species. We found that complex gener generalized linear models based on hierarchical variable selection approaches can work well for single species or smaller regions, um, as demonstrated by this application for the Canada warbler in Alberta. But models can be time consuming to parameterize properly for multiple species. And so what we've concluded is that machine learning is required to automate spatial predictions for multiple species over large areas. Specifically, we're using boosted regression trees, which is a type of ensemble modeling based on developing a sequence of regression trees, each of which is focused on capturing the unexplained, variant, unexplained variation from the previous tree. Shown here is an earlier example from my PhD work, which was focused on climate change projection. Now we're looking at a much larger suite of predictors to capture more environmental complexity. By incorporating this environmental complexity in our models, we can minimize the influence of sample bias on density estimates. In effect, we're doing an informed interpolation of our data across the study area. Another challenge is that landscape change can be pretty rapid and extensive, and especially in the boreal region. The boreal forest is particularly dynamic, with very active natural disturbance regimes, as well as extensive industrial development, including forestry, oil and gas, and mining. These, map these maps here show the extent of forest disturbance over a 25-year period, and the resulting change in mapped land cover types. So we wanted to capture this rather than assuming static uh, vegetation types. And finally, we recognize that there is regional variation in species habitat relationships. Boreal birds generally have large ranges, although the boreal region is quite diverse climatically and physiographically, so naturally there are differences in habitat associations. These figures from a paper by Andy Crosby show differences in the densities of six boreal species across boreal regions on the left, and the relatively low level of niche overlap between Quebec and Alberta for the Canada warbler on the right. It's not clear if these differences are related to differences in habitat preference or differences in habitat availability, but they can be different enough that it's inappropriate to assume constant habitat relationships across the country. Model interactions can address this, but it's difficult to capture everything, so we opted for a regional approach to modeling. To address these various challenges that I've outlined, we've developed a generalized national model approach focused on these key components. First, we use machine learning to deal with complex variable interactions and nonlinear habitat responses in an automated fashion. We include many continuous covariates to capture more nuanced habitat associations and improve the temporal correspondence between avian and environmental data. And we use regional submodels to accommodate differential habitat selection, reduce out-of-range predictions, and achieve better sampling balance. The key elements of our methods are listed here. 
Additional methods and codes are available on GitHub at the link below. We built separate models for each bird conservation region, or BCR, subregion, which consisted primarily of the inter intersections between BCRs and provinces, with some aggregation of smaller units. Each of these units was buffered by 100 kilometers so that we had regions of overlap among multiple models along the edges. We used primarily human point count survey data with a few ARU data sets included. The ARU data were treated in the same way as regular point counts. To be able to quantify prediction uncertainty, we developed models for 32 different bootstrap samples of the data within each sampling unit. Each of these samples was stratified by year and spatial cluster to improve balance. Avian data was matched with the corresponding vegetation data from one of two time periods, either 2001 or 2011, and we will, uh, in future iterations, we'll include annual inputs. For each of these data samples, we built boosted regression trees for the counts, specifying a Poisson distribution and incorporating the detectability offsets that I described earlier. Prediction diagnostics were calculated based on tenfold cross-validation. To predict density, we averaged across bootstrap replicates and smoothed across BCR subregion boundaries. We considered a total of 216 potential covariates in our models, automatically eliminating those that were most highly correlated in each subsample of the data. In all models, we included effects for year and survey type, either ARU or human point count, and then we considered 21 climate variables. 92 stand-level vegetation covariates, which consisted of things like tree species biomass and age, and the same 92 covariates averaged across the surrounding landscape using what's referred to as a Gaussian filter, which is essentially a moving window weighted by proximity based on a normal distribution. We also included three simple land cover variables, five terrain variables at 100 meter resolution, and a coarse scale road layer at one kilometer resolution. Each individual model contained a subset of approximately half of these covariates, many of which had little or no predictive power. Variable importance scores are available online or as a download, uh, as a download file. The primary outputs that we've produced and shared are one kilometer pixel level density predictions expressed as males or pairs per hectare for a snapshot in time, in, uh, in our case 2011. These are accompanied by static maps, which you will see in a bit. We're also generating 250 meter predictions for each BCR subregion, which are not yet uh, posted on the website, but they can be requested from us. In addition, we have habitat specific density estimates produced by what we refer to as post hoc binning, which involves overlaying land cover classes of interest with the raster predictions to calculate mean densities for each class. Because most sources of environmental variation are captured in the models, these mean densities reflect the full range of conditions across the landscape rather than those of a biased sample. We've done this for a 2005 MODIS-based North American land cover layer, but a user could also do this with any other categorical land cover layer. And finally, we have produced population estimates that were calculated by summing up individual uh, pixel level densities within each spatial, spatial unit. We're still uh, working on annual predictions from which trends can be estimated. Um, and we're doing this in collaboration with Adam Smith and Dave Isles at CWS. You'll hear, you'll hear more about Dave's work later in this presentation. And with that, I'll turn it uh, over to Peter. Thank you, Diana. Hi, everyone. I'm Peter Solomos with the Boreal Avian Modeling Project. And after the introduction, I'm going to show you how to view and navigate these results that Diana has just introduced. Our first example species is going to be Canada border. In this map, you can see the results from 16 regional models put together and the map for the study area. You can see this pale yellow region, which is outside of the species range. And within that, different shades of green representing different levels of population density. What's interesting to note here is although the predictions are stitched together from these regional models, these thresholds are based on the whole study area. So those represent how density varies across the whole region. And you can see here this sharp 
change along the Manitoba-Ontario border. The western population represented with considerable smaller average densities compared to the eastern parts of the population within Canada. We can overlay the species range on top of this density map and also the dots here represent the known detections for Canada wobbler. This gives us an idea how the known range compares to our predictions and here we would expect the species range to extend more westwards. Because these results uh, are based on one square kilometer pixel level predictions, we can summarize these pixel level predictions across regions or within regions. For example, if we overlay some kind of land cover classification, we can calculate mean density within those land cover classes. So here, for example, for the whole study area Canada, we can see that density reaches highest levels in mixed wood and deciduous forests. This takes into account the whole study area eastern and western parts for Canada warbler. What's interesting here, you can see intermediate levels of density in wetlands and cropland and conifer forests. We wouldn't expect Canada warblers in croplands, so this is a result of this post hoc binning procedure and possibly how our environmental covariates represent a wider uh, area. So for example, if there is some deciduous forest adjacent to a cropland, then our Gaussian filter at the landscape level might pick it up. The same way as we can calculate mean density over the whole study area, we can look at smaller regions within that. So for example, bird conservation region six, we can see how density varies across land cover types, deciduous forest having highest densities. As compared to this, if we look at the eastern part of the species range and within bird conservation region 12, we can see that there's slightly higher density in mixed wood forest, and this just highlights how this approach is really useful in highlighting these uh, regional differences between habitat selection. We can also look at smaller subregions, for example, for BCR6, how the southern part, where population density is much higher, compares to the northern part, where you can see across the land cover types very uniform and low density levels, deciduous is somewhat higher. In the southern portion of BCR6, you can see mixed wood and deciduous forest topping this chart. The same way as we could summarize the densities across land cover types, we can look at how those numbers add up within these uh, BCR subunits. If we add those up for the whole study area, all the pixels, then we get for Canada Warbler 4.81 million males over the whole study area with lower and upper bounds in parentheses. We can do the same exercise for different bird conservation regions or subregions where we have these estimates. And if we divide the regional numbers with the area of that region, then we get average uh, population density for that unit. Now let's have a look at the website. To view the website, you need to go to borealbirds.github.io. Once you land on this page, you can browse the results by species or read our methods. In the top navigation, the most important par part is this search bar. If you start typing the name of your favorite species, then click on it. Now we are looking at the Ovenbird website page. You can also, by knowing the AOU code of the species, just go to species slash code in this case, slash oven, to view uh, well-known species. We can see here the same national distribution and density map as we've seen before for Canada Warbler. For oven bird, we can see the gradient of varying levels of density. And to overlay the range map and the detections, in this 
right corner we have this show detections tab if you click on it it hides and toggles these detections and the range map you can see there is much better correspondence between uh, the range map and the detections and our estimates than for the previous species if you scroll down then these are the land cover based mean density values for Canada or for any other specific bird conservation region unit or subunit within that if you scroll even further down then you see the population size table for Canada 38.8 million males for oven bird with lower and upper bounds based on the bootstrap distribution underneath this table you will find some links where you can grab for example the raster layers shown in the map in GOT format this link should take you to uh, the Google Drive where you can find those species specific distribution maps if you want to download the summarized results population size estimates and densities and other useful information for example variable importances and validation metrics and the list of uh, predictors you can download this excel file the various sheets are going to uh, help you uh, browse the results by species so this file actually contains the results for all the species the tips are for individual species if you want to access these results programmatically then I really recommend you checking out this JSON API which is described in detail in this technical report if you click on this DOI link it should take you to the Zenodo website where we have a PDF outlining the methods and if you read through there are applications with some worked examples using R how to manipulate these results now going back to the oven bird page at the very bottom of the page you can see a discussion area where you can leave some comments have a discussion about these results if I go back to the top in this navigation click on methods this is the brief outline of how we created these results the description of the subregions and our methodology the last link you can see in the top is contact which takes you to the BAM website where you can learn more about contributors and the data set itself and also under communications you can find those papers that you have mentioned as part of the talk now back to the slides so we've talked about these pixel based estimates these are called pixel based because we make predictions for one square kilometer units of the land base then we add these up in larger units to get population sizes we did a similar study in northern Alberta which was published recently on the pages of the Condor where we looked at how pixel based estimates within BCR6 of Alberta compared to population size estimates for partner, from partners in flight and their approach uses roadside BBS data so we expected to find differences between the two approaches once we took the ratio of the population size estimates for more than 90 species those are the dots in this graph then we found that the pixel based uh, estimates were much higher than the partners in flight estimates and this was to some extent expected because we know that these were driven largely by the differences between the maximum detection distance used by uh, partners in flight and our effective detection radius for the species which are consistently lower than the maximum detection distance which makes this difference between the population sizes there were however species where the PIF estimates were higher than the pixel based one and we can see huge variation across the species which is mostly attributed to other sources of uh, biases which in this case is due to species reacting differently like liking or disliking the presence of roads and their behavior and detection distances might change along the roads and also road sample different habitats and if we have a south heavy sample of BBS routes then in the north we have habitats which might get 
less represented in our roadside sample, which contributes uh, to this difference. Now we've looked at this across species in a single region. Given our current results, where we have 16 such regions, and we can even make smaller ones, and 140 species across all of these, we can look at how these PIF estimates versus the pixel-based ones compare to each other. You can see here similar violin plots. The Canadian average is roughly two times the PIF estimate is what we get for the pixel-based one, although there is huge variation across regions. For example, bird conservation region 11 shows somewhat higher values for certain species, which might be grassland specialists. Other regions you see lower numbers and even there are species where the PIF estimates are higher than the pixel-based ones. So now we are looking at this and we also are in the process of updating our estimates for effective uh, detection uh, distances, which is also then in turn going to be used for updating the PIF estimates. So if you happen to have distance sampling data that we could use, we are part of a collaboration with Adam Smith and his colleagues who are working diligently to update these numbers using fresh new data from not just Canada, but from various parts of the US. So please get in touch. This leads us to some limitations and trade-offs that we wanted to mention regarding our national models. First off, these density offsets that we've used were developed for pastorines in mind. And as a result, population numbers may be overestimated for other species due to their dif different territorial behavior, their aggregation pattern, for example, along water edges, or overlapping home ranges, which might lead to double counting. We can address these concerns using independent estimates that we can use to calibrate our approaches to get better population sizes for these non-passerine species. Another issue might arise as a result of our regional modeling approach that we took to address certain spatial data gaps. This approach can lead to hard boundaries between BCR subunits, and also in some cases, it is difficult to capture range limits. Let's go back to the Canada warbler example. In this map, we can see the results uh, from the 16 regional models put together, and there is this hard edge that we've identified along the Manitoba-Ontario border. If we, however, put together a data set that involves all the data from Canada, and we don't take this regional approach, just fit a single booster regression tree model, then now this hard boundary disappears, but what we get instead is overprediction outside of the species range here in the Western Mountains, Northwest Territories, and Newfoundland. So there's this trade-off between having hard edges versus overprediction, and the national model results are heavily dominated by some regions where we have a lot more data from, so strong regional influences are mediated by going this uh, regional approach way. What we can also see in our maps here for black-throated green warbler, besides these edges alongside the Manitoba-Ontario border, that density is a lot lower in the western part of the species range as compared to the eastern part of the range. Now if you look at the map in the left, which is a distribution map, based on the detections only, so there is no count or abundance information involved in this max and map that Diana described before, which is very similar to just showing the detections from, for example, eBird. You can see what's inside the species range and what's outside where the species occurs versus not, whereas our models, um, as opposed to that, indicate the different levels of density inside the range. So in the West, we are still inside the species range for black-throated green, but densities are much lower than in the East. The next example for the Tennessee warbler highlights how distribution versus abundance compares in the northern parts of the species range, where our regional uh, density model approach 
is having a hard time of finding that northern range edge which is clearly visible in the Maxon maps in the left. Maybe this is a result of the species range extending into the subarctic regions or maybe we just have very few samples to support that. Our density predictions are meant to be used in various conservation applications. For example, these can be used to generate various indices of land bird diversity and intactness across Canada. One application of this work is led by WCS Canada to identify key biodiversity areas according to what's called Criterion C, ecological integrity. We are combining our bird maps with human footprint maps to generate an index of biotic intactness. This work in progress should eventually help inform the identification of key biodiversity areas in Canada. The layers can also be included in a variety of systematic conservation planning exercises at scales ranging from regional to national. It will be particularly valuable to compare areas of land bird diversity with areas of importance for priority species like caribou. A new project initiated by ECCC will look at these synergies and gaps explicitly, work led by Becky Stewart and Ellen Kempfield. Similarly, we are working with the Prairie Habitat Joint Venture to compare waterfall and land bird priorities for the Western Boreal region in order to understand how areas of importance for waterfall coincide or not with priority areas for land birds. These analyses are led by Barry Robinson based on models produced by Nicole Barker et al. Our models were not intended to be predicted in the future, but habitat-specific density estimates from our predictions can be applied to land use change simulations to anticipate future habitat value for birds. We are collaborating with the Western Boreal Project Initiative, a partnership between ECCC, NRCAN, and SPADE's team and academic researchers to apply our models to future change scenarios. This project is led by Samuel Ashe, Elliot McIntyre, and Tati Mishlati. We also modeled the impacts of forest management and natural disturbances using boosted regression trees for Canada warbler and we use these population size estimates uh, to apply on simulated future conditions and quantify the likelihood of regional population persistence under different scenarios with an applied site selection uh, algorithm that maximizes uh, positive future trends for the species in each of the regions. This is work led by Francisco Dennis and is going to continue to inform species at risk critical habitat identification. As Diana mentioned in the beginning of the talk, we are working towards integrating our population estimates into official population trend estimates produced by the Canadian Wildlife Service. This slide shows some exploratory work by Dave Isles at CWS CWS to combine migration monitoring data with stable isotope maps to develop regional trend estimates. Our density models can be used to weight regional trends in a national analysis. This example shown here is for Blackpool Warbler. As we are working on our models, we are anticipating next versions based on a new uh, set of the data which is going to include more years of BPS, additional regional data, and automated recording unit-based um, detections. We are also going to incorporate annual climate and land cover coverage to better match predictors and survey years, and also we want to capture trends in landscape change. We are also planning to extend our modeling into neighboring U.S. regions, to incorporate data from the US that you already have and also we want to extend to the full boreal hemiboreal so that we can cover the breeding ranges of these boreal species. Future versions of the models would also possibly look at smaller subregions but data gaps might still dictate what size of regions we can handle in this regard and we're also thinking about using unclassified spectral data inputs which will also uh, minimize the classification error that we can um, 
have in our data input layers. The key take home messages are that we use these pixel based population estimates, which we think is an improvement over sample based methods when the sample is biased with respect to habitat, as we can see with roadside samples. The BAM density models generate predictions from disparate datasets that can be rolled up into population estimates because we are using detectability offsets to standardize point counts across different methodologies. We employed machine learning algorithms to predict in unsampled areas and many current applications are underway and probably more coming in the future. We wanted to thank uh, the BAM members, partners and funders including Environment and Climate Change Canada and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. See the full list of funders and contributors on our website. You can see the BAM team here, the core members and contributing scientists and grad students. Thank you all for listening to this talk.